Hi, I'm Craig Richardson. Welcome to Mind to Heart. In this show, we take a journey from our logical, critical mind to our heart center where real transformation can occur. My guests help us understand our journeys by telling us about their paths and lessons they've learned along the way. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Robin Weeks, one of my mentors from Atlantic University. I took two courses from Robin in my final two semesters. The first was science and spirituality or science versus spirituality, which we'll get into today. And the other was about the evolution of human consciousness, which I'm sure will seep in as well. Robin's story is unique in that it took him from a purely scientific background where he started out in his home country of England to discovering or rediscovering an innate spirituality. His quest for the truth led him to use his scientifically trained mind to question many of the tenets that modern science presents as infallible. His journey also brought him to the United States and he now lives in Colorado and Sedona, Arizona. As I do typically with my shows, we'll spend the first half delving into issues, in this case, particularly the dichotomy that now exists between science and spirituality, something that really didn't exist up until a couple hundred years ago. We'll then get into Robin's journey where, where he showed how these two worlds can be melded back into one as he went from being a scientist to somebody who's now found and continues to discover his own spirituality. Robin, welcome to Mind to Heart. I know you're a few hours behind me, so I appreciate uh, maybe getting up early or maybe you're an early bird, I don't know, but welcome. Thank you. It's good to talk to you again and meet you again. It's great, it is. We've always, we had several of these, uh, Robin was, was very good at putting videos out and, and uh, I always enjoyed, and then we did some Zoom sessions. Uh, in our exchange prior to the show, you mentioned how, the, you mentioned and discussed uh, the metaphor of Plato's cave as that being symbolic of your journey. And, and as, I, as I mentioned in a synchronistic fashion, I was to give a talk at, at the church I attend a couple weeks ago, and we've had some snowy weather that's rescheduled to a week from this Sunday. And uh, so I think it's, you know, one of the universe's ways of saying, you know, we should discuss this. So um, what I'd like to do is to begin, if I could, since you are a professor or a teacher, um, I actually personally didn't know about it, uh, Plato's cave and his metaphor. I guess, I guess that's sort of a reflection on some of the schooling I did or didn't get. But uh, I think it'd be important if we could just start out in, in, by explaining to people what that metaphor was all about and then how that relates now to what, what we've discussed in our course and, and what's been in your own life. Okay, so do you want me to <clears throat> describe the, the allegory of the cave? Yeah, I think if you just sort of give the, the Reader's Digest okay. version of what Plato okay. said and what he, what, 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 you know, and what that metaphor was all about. Okay, so it occurs in Plato's Republic, one of the dialogues of Plato, and it's, um, it's uh, Socrates is sort of um, giving a teaching on what he thinks true education or true learning is. And um, so he describes this allegory and the allegory uh, has um, slaves, a set of slaves chained deep in a cave and they're chained facing the back wall. So all they know of life is what they see on the back wall of the cave and no light gets in from above. Behind the slaves, there's a fire and of course the fire casts shadows on the back wall of the cave, even though the slaves can't see the fire. And then there's a walkway between the fire and the slaves where um, people are walking by carrying different sort of shapes and, and um, uh, statues and things. So the slaves see these shadows on the back wall of the cave. And the we have to imagine that the slaves are chained there since birth. So all they've known are the shadows on the back wall of the cave. That's all they know. So for them, the world and reality is the shadows on the back wall of the cave. And then Socrates asks us to imagine what it would be like if one of the slaves could um, turn their head and look back up towards the, the, the entrance of the cave and towards the fire and, and everything. And the idea is that this would be a very, to turn around and, and look at what reality is, other than the shadows, what's in fact what's causing the shadows, 
would be very shocking and, and most people would turn back immediately and not want to ever see that again. But occasionally there would be someone who would turn and see this and allow themselves to be sort of transformed by the vision. But it's not just that, it's that he's then asked us to imagine what it would be like if one of these slaves got free of the chains and, and was able to start walking up out of the cave and, and then eventually into the sunlight. And at first they would be blinded. They would hate it, or they would be blinded. It's like, take me back to, to my chains. Um, but eventually they would get used to the sun and, and they would recognize that light was the true source of all of the uh, world, the, the, the shadow world that they were seeing previously. So obviously it's an allegory. It's, it's, it's supposed to um, tell us that there's, we tend to see a sort of, a sort of shallow truth. We live in a world that isn't exactly illusory, but we don't, we don't see that the, there's a deeper and sort of prior truth which illuminates everything that we see in this world. So, um, and for Plato, this was, um, this allegory pointed the way towards these universal um, forms, like the good, the true, and the beautiful. These were divine forms, which were the true source of our world. So it was, it was really talking about a, <coughs> um, a kind of vision of the world that goes beyond our typical five senses. It's sort of seeing into a, a source of this world that is, if you like, metaphysical rather than physical. Well, and, and interestingly, because, you know, one of my favorite movies, uh, trilogies, is The Matrix. And isn't that, in a way, a, 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 an updated version of Plato's cave? We don't have slaves, thankfully, anymore, and we don't have fires as our primary energy source. But, but in that movie, it was the same thing. They were in the sim, and it, and it took, and that reality, in, in particular, is pretty harsh. Uh, it, that, yeah. that, yes. that they, I mean, it was ultimately a battle in order to get that. Was that and I think there's some of that in, in the... And, and where do you see sort of science's role in, in are, are they helping to cast shadows? I mean, I know you, this is your background primarily coming out of that world or, or I mean, they, ironically, I think they would suggest that they are the ones helping to discover the world, right? What yes, so, so the, yes, it is ironic. <laughs> so that there is this idea that with through science we're um, and then that's the idea of progress, which really came along. We didn't really have an idea of progress that before um, the scientific revolution, but this is this idea that we're slowly edging our way towards truth. And so this, every new scientific theory, every new discovery moves us this little bit closer to, to truth. And if we use Plato's cave, um, then if you think about the slaves looking at the world of shadows, they um, would, you would start to have commentators amongst the slaves on the world of shadows and they would start to predict what kind of shadow would come next. And they would, or they would develop a kind of science of the shadows, mm. which would feel real to them. <laughs> but it, it still isn't, right? It's still playing around in the world of shadows. And you know, my perspective, and I don't know if Plato would agree with me, <laughs> but I've got a feeling he would, <laughs> but, but is that that's, that's in, in fact what we're doing in the modern world in, in the sort of name of exposing truth in the name of following the science, if you will, in the sense of revealing truth, we actually are still going ever deeper really into the world of shadows and we're not exposing the sort of the, the deeper strata. So this Another way to describe this is to describe it as being um, sort of sort of superficial. So it's it's breadth, not depth. Mm -hmm. And we we we're, we're ever getting broader, ever ever sort of adding more information and data to this level of information. But we're not we're not through science diving deeper into a kind of uh, reality that science doesn't even can't even really recognize. Well, and, and it doesn't, it wouldn't that depth um, arguably be the spiritual component? I mean, if we're mind, body, and soul, and we're only looking at a physical 
being, if you will, if you're a doctor. I mean, it, and it really strikes me because these studies have been around forever that show, for example, those who have a strong faith in a prayer life while they're going through an illness are, are a lot more likely to recover faster, stronger, and, and all the rest. And to me, that's science, right? That's a, that's a scientific study. Um, but it, w- there seems to be ser- this certain aversion to them even wanting to get into that. There is because um, there are certain assumptions that were made at the sort of beginning of the scientific revolution that, that I think most scientists don't really know that they've made. And so, so there's a worldview to be protected that most scientists have. And it's, it's uh, basically materiality is the source of everything, is this worldview. And so it's the same is true for, with, for example, the theory of, of evolution. It's like we, we make the theory of evolution uh, essentially random, random in the sense of there's random mutations followed by selection. And, and, we, and we, we have to make it random because if it wasn't random, then it would be directional. And, and then that would indicate, that would open this door a crack to there being something deeper, there's some, some kind of purpose or meaning to existence and to what, what, what is going on in this world. And that threatens a particular worldview that even though it doesn't actually need to be based on that that world that worldview that foundation it is and so most scientists resist that with a great vigor and will deride people who, who come in with other suggestions metaphysical suggestions or, or spiritual suggestions so, well, i think it's what you described in yeah. plato's cave when that when, when the courageous one decides to go out and find out what it is and he comes running back and says hey look look at what's out there and they're not like oh let me go with you they want to kill him it's like that's a that you're threatening my worldview and that can't be because what happens if i watch on cnn isn't true i mean what am i what, what's going to happen what, what what else could there possibly be this is what i'm in been fed. And I was thinking as you were talking, because I, as I went through my Atlantic University studies, one of the people that I really kind of fell in love with is, is Carl Jung. And, and I, it struck me is what would modern psychiatry and psychology be if he were the father of, of that, as opposed to Sigmund Freud, who, you know, I, too, is, I'm not a huge fan of his, but he did, you know, bring in dreams and stuff. But, mm-hmm. but uh, Jung, whose father, I guess, was a, was a uh, minister, and he had a lot more in spirituality to him. And, and, and I find in that field, I'm doing a little life coaching now, it's so, to me, that's such an important element when you're dealing with somebody who's going through a journey or going through a crisis or going through an issue, it, not to be able to bring that element in. I mean, do you, would, what do you think about if Carl Jung, for example, more of his stuff had, had, had do you think we were destined along this path or, or, or can we get out of it? Um. Yeah, well, you know, Jung was for me uh, very important in my getting free of this of this worldview that I'm talking about of science. So I was working as a scientist and, and very embroiled in uh, and invested in a particular worldview. But then once I started reading Jung, it started to produce cracks in this worldview, and I was sort of seeing through to something a little deeper. So Carl Jung, I feel like was is very important, and he's important in the sense that he was actually quite scientific or in his approach uh, to uh, psychology and, and the sort of coll- the unconscious and the collective unconscious were, um, he wasn't overtly talking about um, spirituality, but he was in my felt opening the, the door to spirituality. And the, the point being that, and, and I am sort of tuning into what you were saying about working with clients because um, you, you, you know, most people, many people, and, and much of our culture is cut off from any kind of source. And so that makes us all prey to a lot of psychological issues and, and problems. Um, uh, the, the rise in depression, the rise in, in suicide, the rise in you know, uh, taking um, uh, drugs for, 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 for um, mental issues uh, and that kind of thing, mental, the whole issue of mental health is sort of an, like an epidemic in the modern age because we aren't connected to something. And for young, this would have been the unconscious and the collecting of the collective unconscious where in kind of our vitality, the, the land vital, the vital force comes sort of comes from, from this life. So if we're cut off from what's truly our source, the source of who, true, who we truly are, then 
we're prey to a lot of um, neuroses and psychological issues and, and anxiety and everything that we basically see in our modern world. Well, one of the things that I that also exposed me in, in my um, my master's with Atlantic University was the whole Joe Dispenza and quantum physics, which we got into with you. And, and what I've been working on in my own spiritual life is that whole concept of really getting to, to understand that thoughts are energy and and how important thoughts are to your own health. If you walk around like glum from Gulliver's Travel, we're doomed, we're never going to make it. I mean, you know, what you put out there is is what you get back. And can you talk a little bit about that from in terms of, I, and I don't want to get, because quantum physics, even when, as you explained, it was, it, it's a little heady stuff, but but that to me seems kind of like the, the back door maybe for science to, to start looking. Cause that, I mean, that's been around about hundred years now. And, and that's, that's talks about what he's, what did Einstein call it? Wacky science or something or. Yeah. Or play God, God, he said, God, God does not play dice with the universe. And then he um, didn't think that he, well, he called quantum theory or this aspect of quantum theory that is called entanglement because spooky action at a distance which he, did, he didn't really believe in those things or didn't want to. Um, so the thing is, what I th so there's a sort of deeper view of science actually. So science as we use it today, as it is today, is this kind of um, edifice that's built on ground that is, has made certain assumptions and they're actually metaphysical assumptions. And, but it doesn't, um, science doesn't need to make those assumptions in order to operate. And the science, you know, early on, I think, uh, you know, P Plato and, and prior to Pythagoras, you know, uh, science, mathematics, geometry, music was seen as indicative of something deeper, right? So, the, so um, the sh if you think about it in Plato's, the allegory of the cave, the shadows, when seen rightly, tell you that there must be something creating those shadows, right? So, mm -hmm. so the, the, some, the person who's sort of opened up a bit may have turned their head or whatever, might start to see that, yeah, the shadows are produced by something else. There's something deeper behind these shadows. And yet, so the shadows in, in themselves are a kind of proof. And this is the same with science, right? So science isn't overtly spiritual and I don't think it actually can be, but it actually can point, sort of like a finger pointing at the moon, you know, the moon, of course, is not the finger and the, and the moon being the sort of spiritual source or truth of things. So it's, it's the same way science can actually be a finger pointing at the moon. So things like, so the, for me, the, 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 the better way, the more optimum way to look at things like quantum theory are to, and, and really almost any th scientific theory ultimately, but it's more obvious with quantum theory, um, is to see it as a finger pointing at the moon, right? So it's like, it's not actually revealing a spiritual truth itself because it's still in our, our plane. And we're still saying the world's made of equations and mathematics and things like that. It's, it's, we're still um, saying that it's, it's sort of predictable or probabilistically predictable. So, but it's also very odd. <laughs> Quantum theory is very odd and it has these odd aspects to it that that sort of makes something a little more obvious that there's something else going on, that there's a this, there's this sort of potentially that, you know, it can point the way to this deeper strata. So it, I think it can be useful for, for people if, if, if the, to go into spirituality via sort of more rash, <laughs> rational scientific route, um, then that can be something like quantum theory and other aspects of science actually sort of can be useful. But they don't actually reveal spiritual truth themselves. And, and that's where we can get a little hung up, I think. Well, it's interesting. As you were talking, I was thinking of, of uh, Joseph Campbell and, and he, when he describes metaphors and, and how important they are. He says they, they're so important because they allow us with our limited senses to be able to understand some greater mystery. And it seems to me what you're describing when science is in a it may be in a useful form would be to to be like you said that finger it's not it i think the problem is we get hung up in, in our rationalistic world that that finger itself is the reality that is what the mystery is and, and what you're saying is that if science could be used at least i don't want to put words in your mouth but if science could be used more to unveil a greater mystery 
to be that metaphor that allows us to say, oh, wow, this is, there is something greater out there. Yeah, and that is actually my, my current definition of science, my, my uh, preferred definition of science is that it is a revealer of mystery. So that what science does is it reveals mystery. And we tend to look at it in our culture as though it's solving mysteries, which on a more shallow level, it kind of is. But of course, those mysteries that it solves, you know, every, every single scientific law that we have, we have to regard as provisional because there may be uh, uh, future laws that come down the road that overturn that law. So, so it's never, it's scientific law is never a final thing, even though we, might pretend that it is, um, but it, but, but if, if we sort of just change our angle of view on science a little bit, what it does is reveal this sort of a mystery, right? This, we're in this sort of probably infinite universe with, you know, countless gal <coughs> galaxies and stars and, and all of the amazing things that have happened that are around us. I mean, uh, you know, I was thinking about the other day, I mean, just take a, a tree outside and go and look at a leaf well, do we understand everything about a leaf on a tree? Yeah. No, we don't, right? So, so uh, and, and, it, and it gives every sort of sense that we can keep diving into that leaf deeper and deeper and deeper into its physical sort of truth and that there's a kind of a bottomlessness to it. So it's like, you have to say, well, well this, we're not actually getting to uh, an end point of tr a truth end point. We, we can actually just keep going. And that sort of suggests a tremendous sort of mystery, which science can point the way to, you know, and, um, but we don't tend to use it that way. We tend to use it as, no, we're gonna solve the mystery and one day yeah. we've we'll solved it all. Well, I, I, I don't think that's gonna happen. <laughs> no, no, not at all. And I, and I think we're gonna take a break uh, here at the bottom of the hour, uh, but speaking of mysteries, we're, we'll get into the Robin Week story when we get back and, and right. the mystery that brought you from, from the old, the old country that I call it, uh, since I'm, I'm partly English, uh, to America. So we'll take a break and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about Robin when we get back. Sounds great. Hi, welcome back to Mind to Heart with Craig Richardson and my guest, Robin Weeks. If you need to want to get more information about me, uh, my website is craigerichardson.com. And then I think under Robin's name here, We'll have his uh, YouTube URL, so you can check out his and get a hold of him as well. Rob, before the break, we we get, got into at least touch the surface on this sort of science versus or science and spirituality to be kinder. And and again, when we, when you and I were talking about this this show itself, you you thought I the one of the thought, things I thought would be great to have you on there is that you really epitomized both of those because I think as you mentioned, it wasn't. They weren't separated forever. So can we can we start uh, in England um, and and give get some background on on your your upbringing and where you grew up and in your life story? Um, yeah, we we can do that to some extent. Um, you know, you know, I was brought up. Um, so in I don't know many of your listeners will have traveled in Europe or may have lived in Europe, but it's especially in Britain. It's like we're not quite as religious as people are in America. And so um, there's a lot of skeptics, skeptics in, in Europe, <laughs> England. But I was brought up uh, in, in a secular household. So we weren't, we weren't religious and really um, value was placed on, on science mostly. My, and my father was an architect, but my mother a teacher, but we didn't have any um, spirituality in my upbringing was sort of exposed to it at school because they're allowed to have religion in um, school in Britain. So we had, uh, we began the day with a, a religious, mostly Christian service every day. So I was familiar with it, but I, 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 um, I didn't really have any investment or experience with spirituality. And, and in fact, the opposite, my investment was in ever more towards science. So when I discovered that I had so I discovered that I had this love of nature, right? And, and um, as a kid, I was always playing out in nature and, and exploring and stream and streams and everything, and then getting out on the ocean and in the water. And um, I thought that my best way to to uh, get closer to this thing that I loved was going to be through science. I, I thought I'm going to know more about this. So there's this sense of 
if you know more about something, then you know it, if you see what I mean, then you know it better. Yeah. And, and so all you have to do is accumulate more sort of facts and information about something to know it better. Now, I, of course, question that approach, but so I went into science because it, because it related to something that I loved, which was nature. And I thought that it was my way to get to know nature. And, and so, you know, I went to college in Britain and, and, and studied geophysics. Geophysics, why? Because it's, it's physics, use it, physics used to study the earth, mm -hmm. right? which was contained everything that I seemed to love in terms of nature. So I did geophysics there and then um, came over to America. This is my down, the beginning of my downfall. <laughs> well, it wouldn't, wouldn't be the first time that somebody from England came over and didn't have a good experience, shall we say? No, it was a good experience <laughs> and I'm still here. So, so um, <laughs> well, we're, saying, we're happy you are. So, and I went to, to do, do, did a PhD in, in California, um, also in geophysics, studying the Earth's magnetic field and how it works. And, um, and I was just getting deeper and deeper. So how I just sort of like to describe this is my journey into uh, Plato's cave, right? So I'm, I'm, this, is, this was the journey in to, be, to become a believing slave at the bottom of the cave. And so I became, and, and in this period, in the period of my twenties, I was what I describe as a fundamentalist scientist. Mm -hmm. Science was all I believed in. Anyone else was kind of, stupid actually to believe in anything else so religion to me was silly and well, science as, you, was as the... you indicate you because you know we are a much more religious culture i mean yes. and plus we're americans right so we wear our emotions on our sleeve which was probably two things that you probably weren't used to um and and so i can see that that would have been a little bit like whoa um, but you know in california around geophysics you probably found some like-minded folks i mean they're pretty smart out there well, most of my colleagues in science so so my experience in science and I ended up, you know, in total, probably spending 30 years in science. So I, I got deep into science uh, professionally and um, there was never any discussion amongst my scientific colleagues about religion or spirituality. We, we, it was kind of a no-no, don't go there. <laughs> so don't talk about this. And, uh, and, and so we all sort of, um, there was, there was a, an assumption that we all had a particular attitude about religion and this kind of thing, spirituality, that it, that it wasn't really real or, or, or sensible. In fact, you know, after my PhD, I um, again ended up getting a job at the University of Washington in Earth and Space Sciences. And, and um, I did actually, by accident, run into scientists that had a had a sort of spiritual maybe have had a spiritual experience or something that had opened them up and we formed this little group called the science and spirituality group which we met in secret so we met in people's houses with the curtains closed <laughs> it's like we, we don't want anyone to know that this is what we're doing well i was going to ask you excuse me i mean what would happen say for example if somebody you know tragically lost a child or or uh, cancer. I mean, what was was there just no response, or like, oh, it's a tough one, buddy. You know, hope, hope you're hope you're doing okay. Or that's right. It's 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 um, it's just uh, the, the, there was this, this sort of sense of science that it was like you tough it out, you tough it out, right? Because because what we're doing here is instead of like believing in superstition and and religion and that kind of thing to to comfort us. We are now, we have now come of age as, as a sort of humanity and we can sort of face the truth, the, the truth that this is just, just atoms and subatomic particles rearranging themselves all around us. There's no real meaning or purpose to anything. And, you know, you go through life and, and then you die. And, and so it's like, let's face up to this, face up to uh, this sort of, this, this, sort of cold world this cold universe and and so there's a sense of that's what we're doing that's our that's our humanity's coming of age is um so so it's there's a kind of peer pressure to, <laughs> in it science to to hold on to this attitude to not sort of crack and and sort of and then open yourself to something that is mere superstition and, and mere myth and um and not uh, and thereby delude ourselves. You know, we want to 
be in this world with our eyes open to this cold, infinite universe that we're in. Or a cave wall. <laughs> or the cave wall, which of course the, it, it's, it's, you know, you, you, when you're in that position as a scientist, you don't, obviously you don't think it's the cave wall, you think it's reality. And so you think anyone who pro professes anything different has got to be kind of uh, uh, crazy, you know, possibly. And then the other, for the, me, the other important thing though, is that um, there are plenty of scientists that have religious beliefs. It turns out if statistically, I didn't meet them, but not, not or recent, at least not, the, not many, but um, scientists of that kind are able to keep their religious beliefs, if they say their Christian beliefs, separate from their, their sort of day job. So they're able to sort of keep these two things separate. And, and I think the one thing that science did was it kind of drove God out of this world. So it's like you're walking out in nature and the world out there is what we study. And then God is somehow beyond this world, you know. And so it, it, sort of, it sort of furthered this sort of split between God and the sort of everyday world that we live in. I was going to say, that's really kind of what the program has been, hasn't it? Since, well, like we went in our course, it's got late 1800s that obviously has its roots in the Enlightenment. But that's kind of the way we set it up, right? Even in the professional world, you go to work Monday through Friday and hang out on Saturday and you worship on Sunday and then you start it over again. And we, we've sort of put God on a shelf for for most of the time. It's interesting. I'm reading the, if you've ever read the, or I'm actually the audio book, the, the shack, the, the book, the shack, or it's very, it's very powerful. Uh, but it talks about sort of a developing a personal relationship with, with God, which is, which is really even amongst the religion, the formalized religion, it's difficult to, to, to because in the end, and, and if you, you know, the Christian belief is obviously Jesus himself was the personification of God become man, but all religions talk about a personal relationship and i to me that seems a, mo a very difficult in general because of our culture but i can imagine for you in science that you just like you said it was god was something out there and for even those that were were of faith yes that's that's right it, <laughs> yes it's something out there and, it, and it's something you don't talk about in science you don't bring it into science we we still it's really odd because we're still able somehow to look at the world through this material lens so everything is materiality around us and this this split happened you know about 400 years ago with that we we epitomized the split by by looking at Descartes and his philosophy but um but it, it's it's so so scientists get this world they get they own this world and all of its materiality but then who we are us was was something that was left to the church so our inner life or everything was then left to the church so th there was this sort of split but the problem is what happened was and i know we're talking theoretically and not about my life but what happened was that this inner life that that by for descartes was regarded as um something different than the material world this you, you might call it consciousness or whatever that that, that we, we appear to have um, in, in modern, the modern world, science has increasingly decided that it can explain that too. So it, it's whatever, you know, De, Descartes had this, this, this area left for God in you know, a relation with God, but, but uh, science has slowly taken that away and through sort of neuroscience and everything, you know, we now think that who we are arises out of our brains. So it's not connected. Um, We're not connected. <laughs> We're going to go ahead and, and, and skip our break here because I, I want to get, you know, continue with your story. It's, it's very fascinating. Um, so you, you got to the point where you were meeting in secret, you know, with your secret handshakes so that nobody was from the scientific. Can, can you just, that's a fascinating image, but can you explain to me, something must have happened. I mean, did one of these acorns fall on your head or something? What, what sort of made, made you go from Robin sort of there's this is all there is to you know what there might be something more what was there a moment was there a song was there something that happened yeah i don't know well first of all i think it was kind of a really slow process like meeting carl young like in my early 30s for example uh there was there was things that were sort of forming these little cracks in my worldview um uh, and, and then I, I actually did not sort of, I had Christian friends, but strangely enough that I really loved these Christian friends, friends. And I, 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 I could see that Christianity had really done something for, for these people. And so there were, I, I was starting to um, get curious, 
I would say. And curiosity is a dangerous thing. So <laughs> scientists, scientists are supposed to have it, right? But what you find with the majority is that there's, there are these limits. So that their curiosity might, might sort of take place within these limits, but they don't let the curiosity take them beyond these limits. And, and I'm just not that kind of person. So my curiosity starts to, and, and this kind of curiosity is what I think, I think it's very scientific. There's, there could be such a thing as what I would call a true scientist that, that simply goes where their curiosity takes them. And goes where the data takes them. Yeah. Yes, that's right, they don't post limits. So that's what was happening to me. But, uh, and then it, it all sort of cracked or something. And I, I um, for various reasons, I suppose you can never really say what, what actually caused these things. I started to have spiritual experiences and, um, and I had experiences that, that blew, actually blew me out of the water. I couldn't even believe it. It's like, the, it's like you think you're, so it's like, so the slave at the bottom of the um, cave is looking at the world of shadows, not knowing that that's just a world of shadows. When the slaves actually catches a glimpse of the light, then what is happening is that um, a deeper reality, in fact, more of reality is suddenly um, perceived by that slave. And when you have a spiritual experience, this is the intrusion of this of, of a sort of true reality into one's life. And you don't forget it and you don't ignore it. So it reminds so, me a little of the, you know, the people and not that this was your experience, but the near death experiences where they, yes. they can be as atheistic as, as they, you know, but then when they have that, they're never the same. They're, they're touched. They can, they're literally touched by the finger of God and they're, and they go back. In fact, ironically, they never, they don't want to come back. They're like, and I think that's what you described with, with the uh, have daring to turn around in the cave and, in that reality and even in the matrix it, like i said it wasn't that great a reality that those guys were eating gruel or whatever it was and they were in fights with the machines but the fact that they were free and that they knew a greater reality than what they had been living was enough to keep them going and it sounds like yeah. you had whatever that spiritual awakening was for you that that's really right changed life. that's right and and um and and then it's like a whole new world opened up for me at that time and at the time I thought of it as sort of an inner world. So, so and through meditation and practices like that, I wanted to explore that world, this inner world. And, and, and through science, I'd been exploring outwardly. And, but my curiosity, once you sort of see a whole universe opening up, well, you want to explore it if, you're, if you've got true scientific curiosity. So, yeah. so I did, I started to explore that. And I, you know, I got into meditation and, and formed these groups and, slowly became clear that I was messing around with the shadows for you when I was doing science and I kind of I kind of ran from science actually I I just felt like um, because I'd experienced uh, existence beyond the mind so I had experienced um, you know periods where my mind had gone completely quiet and, and yet I was more um, alive than ever I had ever been. And so I, I knew, so I just know that I wasn't my mind. I identified myself with my mind in the past, but, but I, now I know there's, that there's more in the mind. So I sort of was on the run from the mind. I sort of, for, for a little while, just a few years, I kind of made mind the enemy. Mm -hmm. and, and then just, I was just into spiritual practice and, and meditation practice and meditation retreats. And, you know, and I, I left science and I went to Naropa and um, did a master's degree in religious studies. Oh, wow. And, um, and so Naropa is a place that, you know, was started by a Tibetan Buddhist and they believed in what they call the, they had the, the model of education was called contemplative education. So you had to do contemplative practice as well as academic study and going backwards and forwards between the inside, your insides and your outsides. And um, for me, ultimately that became quite, transformative but the odd thing about it was that I, I got there thinking that I was leaving science and the mind behind and what happened was science and the mind came back in a wholly different way for me um, I didn't I didn't um, let it go I didn't ditch it entirely in fact I discovered that I had a deep love for science and the use of the mind it's just that it wasn't the whole story 
and and so there's this your this the 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 sort of subject of your show your your podcast is this journey from the mind to the heart and and that's that's this thing the heart is for me sort of the gateway to this sort of spiritual perception the perception of the light that's coming down plato's cave not the shadows and the, and and so it needs to be in charge of this process but nevertheless the mind is still this brilliant thing that we've got i mean the world of ideas and um, what we've done with our minds, what we can do with our minds is, is fantastic, it's brilliant. And all of the, the history of all the world's thought and thinking is amazing. So well, as you're talking, I'm thinking of that little, that child when you were out in the creek in, in England and, and it seems to me you kind of rediscovered that in a way. I mean, because you, you, when you're kids, you're sort of naturally spiritual. You don't really know it, but, but you're, you hadn't been drummed into that. You hadn't been in that scientific uh culture or, or world culture really um but it sounds to me like as you're talking you you've kind of reconnected with that child again where you're just enjoying because you're right it is you, you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater is one of your expressions that you used to use a lot you don't want to say oh the mind is nothing i'm just gonna and, and, and you know it's very natural i think when you discover spirituality or anything sort of throw yourself into it and say oh everything else i did before was wrong and now it's right and, and so i think your story beautifully illustrates how it's a coming back together of, of these two, the mind and, and the heart. That's right. And that's, you know, the original meaning of, well, we have the word yoga, of course, which we all probably know means union. So it's the union of two things, but religion also in its origins, if you go back into the Latin religio and religare, it, it also meant binding together. So some things, some things sort of, uh, coming into this world, however we do that, um, something gets something tends to get sort of split apart or separated, and so there's a process of rebinding things together that is needed, and that happens through spirituality and religion. And I'm no longer anti-religious, obviously, because there's I clearly see that there's something important that religion has to do for us. Otherwise, we we live in this world as a, a partial being. In fact, not even really aware of our being, and, and that's not not a good place to be. Well, and I remember discussing in your class. So we we and you presented some information where a hundred years ago, or more than that, one hundred and ten years ago, or twenty years ago, the science basically said we've solved the God problem. There is no God, and and uh, it's that T-shirt that I reminded have been reminded of where the front says. God is dead, Nietzsche, and on the back it says Nietzsche is dead, God. Um, so you know, he 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 got beat up pretty badly in the 20th century. But I think as we get towards or or whatever your concept of of universal consciousness or all, I just see that you know the positive is, and again I think your story illustrates that because not only was it your own story, but it was also the time frame when you were living, and I'm I, most of that time with with I. I mean the culture itself had become very you know, atheistic in a way. And, and now we're getting to a point where these spiritualities you had in your experience in Naroba and we've got yoga, you mentioned. And it seems that we are coming back together again, are we not? I, I hope you're right. I, I um, you know, it's, it's, it's now probably 15, 10, 15 years since I was actually working as a scientist. And, and you know, back then I, I didn't sort of see um, a, new, a new way a new worldview sort of penetrating um, into this, this, the realms, the halls of science that I was walking in around in. But it may be that, that we're in the midst of a shift and that that's happening more and more. Um, you know, certainly I know of scientists that, that are, um, you know, have spirituality and are, are exploring, exploring the limits of science. So, I mean, I, I, uh, I hope you're right. You know, because it certainly seems to me to be what's needed for our culture. Yeah. Well, and I think the field you just discussed and the, and the one that you were part of is going to be the last nut to crack, is it not? I mean, it, it, it just be, well, maybe not. I mean, maybe maybe some will take, because because I think, like you said, when you apply the scientific process to the universe and bring in things that you're not willing, you weren't willing to before, I think you, you're ultimately led to the conclusion. But I mean, maybe not. Maybe that is, maybe that is going to be a tough nut to crack. I don't know, you know, I take sort of 
people like Stephen Hawking, for example, I mean, they, they've got an incredibly deep uh, understanding of theoretical physics, uh, theoretical probably and experimental physics, but, uh, but, but remained an atheist. And, and mm. that this wasn't, of course, true of Einstein or and many other scientists. Most of the founders of quantum theory were, were at the same time mystics. So um, it's, it's, uh, there are definitely precedents for, uh, for having a deep spirituality. For, for, I think for Einstein, there was a kind of, you know, for me, one of the main things about science and, and our um, time, like time in nature or, or basically opening to life is the experience of wonder or in the sense of awe and wonder. And when this is awe and wonder is like this little doorway open to the light coming down Plato's cave, right? So for, Einstein, for someone like Einstein, you can see it when you read what he said and things that he said that the, the, the universe for him was a kind of doorway to, to this sort of deeper sense of wonder and awe, which is the beginning, you know, Plato said that um, philosophy begins in wonder, philosophy being the love of wisdom, begins in wonder. Well, um, and, and spirituality may well begin, to begin in wonder. Well, I think we have about a, about a minute or so left, but it, I think that, you know, you mentioned the, the door and, the, and you've mentioned cracks throughout the way. And I, and I do think that that's been what, what's happening is that those, the God's love or, or the infinite intelligence love is starting to penetrate. It's not everybody. And, and you know, that's partly why we're here, I think, just to learn. But do you, in the last couple of seconds here or so, do you have any parting wisdom that you want to uh, you want to instill on my, my listeners? And I really appreciate you taking the time that I, I don't know about parting wisdom, but but it's it's I think for me, the whole process to become aware of our worldview and be able to try and step out of our worldview in that process of transformation. So it's, it's um, uh, realizing that we have a limited perspective that at least in part creates our reality, the reality that we see. So, and, and reality is always greater than what we can see. Well, so that, we, that, that's well put. And, and I think, you know, it's simple. I think it is, it's as simple as going outside as Robin did as a child and now as an adult and enjoying nature. So again, Robin, it was a pleasure to, to spend time with you. I, I miss our time together with at Atlantic University and, and hopefully you'll come back sometime. Thanks. For I would time. love to. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Mind to Heart with me, Craig Richardson. My path has led me from the Protestant and Catholic churches, as well as studies in alchemy, mediumship, Eastern philosophy, and most recently, Edgar Cayce and transpersonal psychology. As an intuitive life coach, I am ready to guide you to an amazing life. For more information about me, visit craigerichardson.com.